he likes seafood. <laughs> right, so if anybody wants to treat him to anything, you know what to do. Let's welcome Kurt. I want to thank you all for having me here in this uh, wonderful state of New Hampshire. I, I, I have been here several times in the past. I, I, I came here several years ago. I spoke in front of the legislature when the governor, uh, Sheehan, was uh, the governor at the time. And I've been around here, and Arnie and I are old friends, and, and you know, we just, you know, I love this state. It's so similar to the one of Maryland that I come from. I want to thank everybody, and Judge, I want to thank you, you and, uh, and all your support and all the leaders here at the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. It's great to know you all. I usually start off my talks, and, and thank you for that uh, wonderful thing. Uh, I, you got to watch what you say to people, because they will tell you, they will say it. <laughs> But it's the truth, so uh, I am single and I do like eat seafood. So, um, I want you guys, and we're, I'm going to talk about something that you touched on, sir, is uh, about uh, prison. And I'm going to talk about that in, in, at length here in a second. But first of all, and since we've got a few lawyers in the room, I want to tell you about the first lawyer I ever had. Now, I want you to picture a prison visiting room, okay? There's a glass partition between you and your lawyer. Your lawyer comes in off the street to an archway that's eight foot high and ten foot wide. And he sits with his back to a brick wall. And the first thing out of his mouth, he says, he says, Kirk, you're in a lot, lot of trouble. He says, but don't worry, I know my way around the courtroom. I know my way around the criminal justice system. We're going to find our way out of here together. So I started feeling a little better. I didn't have any money, and this was a, my public defender, and he was going to try to save my life. Talked about the case for about 20 minutes, and right before he gets ready to leave, he reiterates what he said in the beginning. He says, Kirk, don't worry. I know my way around the courtroom, around the criminal justice system. We're going to find our way out of here together. And he put his hand on the glass to say goodbye. <coughs> He picked up his briefcase, turned around, and ran right into the wall. <laughs> he was right. I was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> really funny. Isn't it? But on August 9th, 1984, at about 2:45 in the morning, it wasn't funny at all. Open up. It's the Baltimore County Police Department. I have a warrant for the arrest of Kirk Noble Bloodsworth. I go to the door, had a, uh, a, a terry cloth shirt on. It's a hot summer in 1984 in Maryland. Silk running shorts on, no shirts, you know. All I had uh, was uh, uh, barefooted, and they brought me outside. Step outside, Mr. Bloodsworth. You're under arrest of first degree murder, USOB. And they said the full sentence. for killing nine-year-old Donald Hamilton. I'm a discharged Marine with no criminal record, no criminal history, never been arrested for anything. And, you know, I was a Marine. I wouldn't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I was an angel, for God's sake, but I was not the person they said it was. I was a hard-working guy, a commercial fisherman on the eastern shore of Maryland, where I was a crabber with my father. It's been a fisherman in my family for 250 years. I'm the last one. We have an island in Chesapeake Bay named after my family called Bloodsworth Island. Okay, we used to hang out with pirates and stuff, but we were good people. <laughs> we were. We were good people. And I grew up in a good home. Christian parents. My mother, uh, God bless her, uh, she was a, a good woman. Taught me how to read. The next thing I know, this whole thing started because a next-door neighbor called the police 
and told uh, them in Baltimore County, I had just moved there, I had only been there for less than 20 days. I was just newly married, my wife couldn't stand the 16 hour days of, of uh, how a fisherman's life is. You're, you're just married to your boat. I mean, that's your, really your first wife. And you just have to do that job 16 hours a day, six days a week, from April until October. <coughs> that was my, my, my life. She wanted to move back to Baltimore County, where she was from. I got pining over my wife really badly. I left the, 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 the man I was fishing with and hitchhiked to Baltimore on 4th of July weekend, 1984. So this whole thing was based on a witness identification of the last person seen with Dawn Hamilton. And the description of this person is as follows. Six foot five, curly blonde hair, bushy mustache, tan skin, and skinny. <laughs> My hair was as red as an apple in 1984. I mean bright, I looked at pumpkin. Okay, that's the closest thing I can tell you. Sideburns down to here. Had a missing tooth in the front. I do not tan. Okay, I'm a redhead. I don't tan. I burn. I'm about six foot tall. You know, weigh about 230, 240 pounds. Now, there was five identification witnesses in all. Positively, now wait a minute, positively, no doubt in their minds. Positively said it was me, the last person they hit saw with Dawn Hamilton. Now, I was arrested on a Thursday, August 9th, 1984. They called each and every witness in the case and told them not to watch television. We arrested the suspect and we don't want you to watch TV and take the ID because we're going to have a lineup on that coming Monday. They called every witness and told them that and said, by the way, his name is Kirk Bluzko. <laughs> it was just one of so many red flags that flew in my life in this time. Anything I did and anything I said, from the time I was arrested till the moment I was released, I told anyone and everyone I was an innocent man. I used to write my correspondence, respectively submitted, <laughs> Kirk Noble, Bloodsworth, A period, I period, M period. I signed some shirts back there tonight with the same inscription. The lineup comes, the two main witnesses were two little boys, and I'm going to talk about the crime in a minute, because we need to talk about these things. This is what we need to talk about in the communities, and the, the horror of what this little girl had went through. On July 25th, 1984, just a few weeks before I was arrested for this crime, nine-year-old Dawn Hamilton had a sleepover on the night before. She woke up, she watched The Facts of Life on TV, at about 10.30, 11 o'clock. About 11.30, I think they all went outside. According to the court reports. She was it. She come along in Baltimore County, there's a small little hamlet with a pond around it, you know? And the, her parents and her uh, aunt that was watching her that day told them, you know, stay out of the woods, stay out of the pond, because there's a lot of trouble. This is Baltimore County now in Essex. It was a bad part, bunch of people. There was like 15 known sex offenders in and around Fontana Village Apartments. All sorts of different really crazy people. She came across two little boys that were fishing, catching some sunfish in that little pond next, it's called Bethke's Pond. She come across them and asked them for help to find her friends that she couldn't find. They declined, they just caught this turtle, they were more interested in that, but a man on the rise of a hill area with the sun behind his head spoke up and said he would help her find her friends. And with Dawn leading the way, she wasn't found until 2.30 that afternoon. This is right around between 11.30 and 12 when they walked out. They found her body lying face down in a pile of leaves. Her head was crushed with her, what they thought was a rock. Her throat was stepped on with so much force that this imprint of the shoe embedded into her flesh. 
and she was naked from the waist down, her shorts and panties were in a tree nearby her body, and the ultimate horror placed upon this little nine-year-old girl with a page boy haircut was a stick that was inserted in her body. That is what this honorably discharged Marine was charged with, and they were seeking the death penalty in my case. I had no idea what I was about to enter into. I had never been arrested. I never had to get a lawyer. You know, the one I had wasn't very good. He saw me three times in my entire eight-month stay before I went to death row. The trial lasted about two weeks. Everybody coming forward and pointing at me and saying, that's the guy, there's the monster. Let's talk about the witnesses really quickly. You had the two little boys now. When they went to the lineup in the first on that Monday, they never identified me in the lineup. Even when they saw the pictures in the photo array that they gave them before they even had the lineup, they said the hair was too red. They said his, his, his eyes don't look quite the same. They're similar, but they're not the same. They kept saying. They also said that the guy they saw had a Fu Manchu type of a mustache. It went over. They didn't describe it as that. The cops did. And he went over like this. The police never put their mustache on. This is made out of an identikit called, it's made from Disney. It's a sets of overlays in this composite that they put together. Sets of overlays, eyes, ears, noses, mouths. And it's like, you know, how those old projectors used to put celluloid slides on to make this face. They weren't happy with it. The other little boy could, the littlest of the two, Jackie, couldn't make the composite. But the older Chris tried to, and he came up with this one little picture. And so what they did, they took the two little boys and put them together to agree upon the older child's composite. They rode home in a police car. They went to the, to the lineup, never identified me in the lineup until two weeks later, they called the police after I had been on TV for two weeks and said, it looks like, my, uh, it, it looks like we made a mistake, it's really number six, and that's the position I stood in, along with four other police off, four police officers and one other uh, DUI inmate from the county jail, and he stood next to me. Now, after all this was over and everybody talked, there was witnesses that they had. They had one guy named James Keller who was testified in, in open court that he had saw this individual as early as six in the morning. So we started talking to him. Uh, you know, my lawyer started asking him questions. Well, where did you see Mr. Bloodsworth at? And he said, how did you identify him? He said, I saw him on TV. <laughs> there was another witness. Uh, she had said she wrote her statement out and read her statement, said I had made, made some incriminating remarks. And the problem with that is when we got her on a stand, we asked her where she went to school. She was a drop and she could not read or write. And it was a simple statement that she was given by my lawyer, can you read? And she could not even read that. There was another witness who said she had saw the man and heard him say, we're all playing hide and go seek, identified me, but in the first initial statement, she never seen him at all. She just heard somebody say these words. The trial went on. I had an alibi of over 10 witnesses. It was my day off from work. I never left the house that day. I was working at a wicker warehouse when I had moved to Baltimore. I got a job within a week because I could lift a lot of things. I could empty a, a, a trailer truck out in no time. I had lifted so many uh, you know, bushels of crabs and oysters and I just wanted to work. That's all I wanted to do, make make money for my family. It didn't really work out between my first wife and I and I moved back to my hometown of Cambridge and left everything there August the fourth weekend. A month to the day I had went up. And that's when they came and got me. The trial lasted two weeks, and when it was over, the gavel came down on my life. The sentence was death and double life. The courtroom erupted in applause, give him the gas and kill his ass, they said. They partied until 
They applauded so loud you could hear them. They sent down the courtroom halls. My life was over. I became the most hated man in the state of Maryland in a matter of weeks. I wound up going to one of the most notorious prisons in the United States, the Maryland Penitentiary at 954 Forest Street. You were talking about prisons and how we're talking about accountability and all that. But I'm going to tell you what the cell looked like when I was in. I was in handcuffs and waist chain and belt and ankle irons. I get off this bus and I go down a narrow corridor down the causeway and I can hear the cat calls coming because the Maryland Penitentiary looks like a gothic castle. 20 foot thick granite stone, silver spires reaching up to the sky. Something right out of Castle Dracula. And the cat calls are coming from the guard. We're going to get you, Kirk. We're going to do to you what you did to that little girl. Over and over and over and over and over for months and weeks at a time. They took me to my cell in this narrow 120 some foot tier. It was death row. They put you on suicide watch first when you first come there. They opened that 300 and some pound door that was painted in chip paint of yellow and gray and blue and different shades. And when that thing slammed shut, it sounded like the tailgate of a dump truck. They stuck me in a cell that I could take both arms like this and touch either wall by just going an inch either way. I could take three steps from the back cell and be to the cell door. I had a metal rack, a stainless steel toilet and sink, slate floors and ceiling. This place smelled so bad. Dirty cleaning water and lack of good hygiene. And there was about 500 and some of us on one side or the other. Between the two, you could hear the screams of the psychotic at night. All sorts of hollering, moaning, gnashing of teeth, as the Bible says. This was my life. This is where I was bound to be. I got a styrofoam cup that was supposed to be full of spaghetti. All I can remember was my mom, who the last dinner I ever had with her, when she was alive, it was fried chicken and mashed potatoes. And this styrofoam scum with a tomato in it. It was supposed to be spaghetti. It was a bite taken out of it. I just ate it anyway. Because I was a Marine and I we weren't going to let them see me fall to pieces. But something happened to me that night I didn't, wasn't ready for. It. I succumbed to all the pain and all the anguish of being accused of being a child killer. I had one blanket, a Naga hide mattress, and that was it. I took the blanket, I crawled underneath the bunk, and pushed my face in it so hard so nobody could hear me, and I cried myself to sleep. I was 22 years old. For eight years, 10 months, and 19 days, I stayed place where I did not belong. I remember one of the first nights I spent there and I became a prison librarian for seven and a half years. I've read everything from Gestalt Psychology to Stephen King. Whatever was in the <laughs> library, I read it. Don't everybody ask me what Gestalt Psychology is because I have no idea. <laughs> but I was reading this magazine one night and the I was looking up because you lay down, you know, you was laying down and I was propping myself up a little bit and the lights went out. Everywhere. There was no light anywhere. It was like a cave, something like some cave here in New Hampshire. You could not see your hand in front of your face. And then the other convicts started streaming because they can't see now. They started shaking the bars and filling their toilets with toilet paper and socks and flooding the tears below, and I was below them, and this cascaded, this incredible waterfall comes sweeping around my bars and sliding in my floor with all sorts of things in it. These things were hitting me in the face, in the mouth, and coming out of the ceiling, and now they're lighting fires. They're lighting their Bibles on fire. 
They're lighting their Qurans on fire, books, anything they could get. This screaming and smoke is going everywhere and these things are hitting me in the face and in the eyes and the power popped back on. And I'm not kidding folks, there was a sea of cockroaches swimming across the ceiling, running away from the light. If you swooped your hand over them, they would run through your fingers like grains of sand. I used to have to take wads of toilet paper and stick them in my ears so they wouldn't crawl in and everything. Because they would. One of my neighbors had that happen to him and he went mad. But this was my life. My case was overturned by prosecutorial misconduct. They pulled a report about a suspect that the judge knew about for two years. Not like you, Judge Murphy. I couldn't believe that this man had done this to me. He sat on this evidence and he kind of said, well, it's not exculpatory. Well, let me just explain what the evidence was. It was about a man on an access road in a station wagon the day of her murder, 187 feet away from her body saying he was rolling up newspapers. And when they found him, they never had any ink on his hands. And he's the one that found her articles of clothing in the tree. He would literally almost had to walk over her to find those items. When they searched his car, because he gave the underwear and clothing to his, her father that was watching and was looking in his search, they searched his car and found a pair of little girl's panties in his console. They asked him, what are you doing with these items? And his explanation for this was, I found them in the same woods two days before, and I'm going to take them home and wash them and give them to my daughter for her dolls. They had a red spot. They never tested to see if it was blood. When they found the armored garments, he vomited. And the state of Maryland said that was not exculpatory because he was two inches shorter than me. Not the suspect, me. And two, and uh, had long hair. Remember, this is the sun was behind his head. These are two little boys. But the Court of Appeals thought otherwise. My case was overturned and I was sent back to retry. There was, so, there was a, like a plethora of different suspects. There was one suspect that was let go for two attempted rapes of two little girls a year before, two weeks before Don was murdered. His police report came across the Baltimore County desk. They never went back to check him out. His name was Kimberly J. Ruffner who had a record as long as I am tall. They never went to check it. The same trial happened again. And they sought the death penalty. I'm like, hey, you know how much it cost the state of Maryland to prosecute me twice? Six million dollars. And they got it wrong. I went back to prison. They convicted me again and sentenced me to double life. My life was about over now. I didn't know what to do. Everything from direct appeal to writ of cert, everything I was trying was denied, 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 denied. The screw was tightening down on my life. And this was it. I was now just 30 years old, almost nine years now. I had a book in the mail that was given to me by the guards. Um, I don't know where these books came from. It was four books, and one book was about origami. I didn't want to have time to fool with that. <laughs> uh, there was another book about pastel drawings. I figured I'd keep it. Um, but the one book that took my imagination away was a book written by a former uh, son of a Pittsburgh police officer and a cop in his own right, Joseph Wombaugh. Joseph Wombaugh had made books into movies, The Choir Boys and The Onion Field, and all these different true crime stories. Son of a Pittsburgh police officer, L.A. police officer himself. He wrote a book about, called The Bloody, the first time a new technology was ever used in a criminal case. Dioxyribonucleic acid, otherwise known as DNA. 
And to make a long story short, the founder of this technology is named Alec Jeffries. He came up with this new technology back right about a month uh, after I was arrested. He found the one gene that separates us all and it could identify any person in this room doing the right test. I read on, they, they tested 5,500 men in the town of Narborough to with Patrick Leahy of Vermont. And, uh, you know, I've met some really good people and judges too, Judge Murphy. And, you know, I know it's a thankless job at times, but I wrote this prosecutor and I could not believe how just driven they were to make this stick with me somehow. I wrote her a letter and I said, I want to take this new test, it's called genetic fingerprinting. I want all the evidence uh, tested, and this is in 1992, there was only two DNA labs in the United States then. But I had the world's leading geneticist do mine, Dr. William Blake, in Forensic Science Associates in California. He's the one that helped set up the FBI's lab when they first got started. But I wrote the prosecutor in a letter, and she wrote me back the letter, and she said, we regret to inform you that DNA has been inadvertently destroyed. I, I thought I was gone then. But I, I, I kind of stopped myself in mid-stride, and I said, you know what? I don't really believe what they're saying to me. I have my lawyer, who's a judge now in Washington, D.C., Robert E. Moore, and he sits on the Superior Court in the District of Columbia. And uh, he says, Kirk, I've been there twice. You can't find the evidence. I said, Bob, if you don't go back and check one more time, I'm going to call you 20 times a day versus 10. And he says, I believe you will. I said, I'll write your wife and everything. Stop. Go, go look. I said, I, I can't stand it anymore. You've got to get me out of here. He went back to check, goes to the evidence room where the evidence is supposed to be. It's not there. He's getting ready to leave, and guess who he walks into? My second trial judge is Judge Smith's court clerk. And he sees him in the hallway and says, Bob, what are you doing here? And he says, uh, I'm looking for the Don Hamilton evidence in the Kirk Bloodsworth case. He says, I know where that's at. And he said, where? He says, it's sitting in the judge's closet in a paper bag in a cardboard box in the floor. Life should not be subject to a treasure hunt. Yeah. <laughs> and there was the evidence I so needed. It took a year for the evidence to come back. And I tell you what, in that last few months of my incarceration, I lost the greatest thing. Mine. Mother died uh, five months before I was released. He allowed me to go to her funeral in handcuffs and shackles for five minutes, uh, and not to her funeral, just to see her body. I kissed her goodbye and went back to prison, the innocent man. You, Senator Sam, you were talking about your mom, and my mom was a big supporter of mine. She told me that. Have a read. You would really love her. She's about five foot two. She could do a New York Times crossword puzzle in 30 minutes and not get any wrong. Anything wrong. I used to check her. And, but she used to write letters to me and she always supported me. And she said, My son is not like this and he's a good boy. And I would know if my son had committed something like my father did too. They all stood up. And then one of her biggest things, when she would write me letters, she would say, you know, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Stand up. She would say, right is light, to try to encourage me to just keep fighting and don't give up. Because she knew her son. I was going back to the prison and I could hear my mother's voice in my head, my priest from... Uh, the Baltimore Archdiocese was there with me, and his name is Al Rose, and he came with me to the funeral, and I was just, I was panicking. I could hear my mother's voice in my head, stand up. And it got louder as I got close to the prison, and she said, stand up. 
And as I got closer to the prison, she said, stand up. And by the time I got into the gate, I was literally straining at the chains, hunched over, standing up from my seat in that van with the ring goes through the floor, just pulling like some sort of crazy act. My priest was like, now I was looking at me like I was crazy. I stood up, a smile came over my face, and things started to change. On June 28, 1993, I stepped out of Maryland Penitentiary, a free man. I didn't go home in a police car, I went home in a limousine. My dad asked me, he says, what do you want to eat? I said, I want something with seafood in it. <laughs> <laughs> I want some hard crabs and or steam crabs. That's really what I wanted, some steam crabs and some beers, and that's what I wanted. And I had a few beers, and, but I had crab soup, crab dip, salt <laughs> crabs, hard crabs. I just, I crabbed it up. <laughs> I was so happy to be free. And my life changed forever. I knew that right then in that moment that whatever could happen to me could happen to anybody. If it could happen to an honorably discharged Marine with no criminal record or criminal history, everybody. Next thing I know, I started seeing people like Ray Crone and different individuals coming out of jail. You know we have 144 individuals who have been exonerated in the United States just from death row. And you say, oh, well, DNA can say that. We can really find out who they are. Wait a minute. 18 of them are DNA exonerations. We have 311 DNA exonerations. The National Registry says we have over 1,000 innocent people with a prison population of over 2.3 million. How many innocent people do you think there are in prison? More than we would want to say, or our, some of our people that want to keep the death penalty would say, but I know there's 144, and I've worked with 32 of them at the Witness Innocence. I am the Director of Advocacy for the organization. I want to leave you in this moment. New Hampshire doesn't need the death penalty anymore. Even if they have one person. Because if you want to knock it down and you want to be use some uh, spiritual fervor, even God would not destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah had he found innocent people in his midst. We are not God. We don't know who's there. And if it can happen to one person, if it can happen to 144, it can happen to one person. If you want accountability, keep them in there for life. Now as you go out to fight this fight, you need to get up, sit up, hold your head up, and never give up. Because New Hampshire is ours. I want you to stand up with all your friends and tell everybody what you heard tonight. Stand up with them. Don't leave them aside. And when you stand up, my God, please, turn around and don't run into that wall. <laughs> <laughs>
And that's the way it should be. I was one happy guy. I was all I could take. Hey, I drank a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? In the back, lady, in the vest. I was just curious, you started at the beginning saying something about your neighbor, and, and I'm yeah, curious story, why, my, they, yeah. why they picked you. Uh, they saw the composite <laughs> sketch on TV and said it looked like me. That's how it all started. This is a person trying to be conscientious, you know. And, you know, there's another, since you brought that up, it's really interesting that um, almost 20, I think it's 25% of uh, all wrongful convictions happen because of jailhouse informants. People who, uh, uh, you know, just tell people about crimes. There's another thing, people confess to crimes they didn't commit. That's another 18, 20%. So many reasons in it, and she was just trying to be helpful, but uh, really uh, didn't help in no way, shape, or form in the end. Questions? I just wondered if there was just a, a little. <laughs> <laughs> if there was a lesson that you might from that campaign that you might share with us in New Hampshire. All right. Uh, Keep Mona Kadena in your eyesight 24 hours a day, <laughs> and because uh, I certainly did. She is the most nerdy person in this room, I'm pretty sure, and she knows facts that not everybody knows. The other thing is, too, we worked as a team, and that was really important. And people like Rennie Cushing and, and all you people that came forward, these are the ones that has to keep pounding this thing into the legislature like a hammer. And don't, you know, I'm going to come back. I'm not leaving you alone. I mean, I'll, I'm going to be here. I'm here for a week, and when the legislature starts up, we're going to just hit the ground running. And I'm going to, I'm going to help you all I can. And uh, that's what Witness to Innocence does. If I can't make it, I'm going to bring somebody here that can. And, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we'll really get it going. But don't give up. And think about the little things, because that's what Mona does. Think about the little things. Think how you can talk to this person. Think how you can get uh, this person's attention. Um, whatever significance they might have. And I'm just, you know, I'm that kind of way. And, you know, uh, the senator was talking about it tonight. You just be yourself, Sam, right? And just tell them the truth. Because there in no way they can hide from the truth that the death penalty is a failed policy. It's no more argument that it's worth anything. It's just time to give it up. And it would save a lot of people's time in the state of New Hampshire. You went about it some other kind of way and stop even uh, exercising this policy because it has failed and failed miserably. And, and how much of a factor has race played, or does race play, in terms of the death penalty? <laughs> it's part of the premature order question, but still, it's an important one. It, well, you know, I mean, Begs the question, New Hampshire has one death row inmate and he's black. The death penalty is racially, has more racial disparity in it than just about any, anything I've ever seen. Black on white crime gets the death penalty far greater than white on white crime. They get the death penalty far greater. Uh, the average person within the prison system today, I mean, you know, I would, I would even say that this is the new kind of lynching for black people. Um, I've seen it so pervasive, and race is, is such an issue. I, you know, poor people, economic disparity, racial disparity, jurisdictional disparity. Mona said it right, 2% of this daggone country is the one that's pushing this whole thing. Maybe that's why the country can't work, because they're pushing against herself. We gotta get out of this thing. And uh, it's going to be really important, but I tell you what's the most important thing. It's going to be people and constituents from New Hampshire that need to get on board on this train to get it to work. We had a lot of people and that came forward and finally in the final analysis, religious leaders and all people from every different scope you could think of, victims, family members. I worked with, you know, uh, Vicki Sheber and Benita Spikes. They were murder victims, family members themselves, and stepped out like Rennie. And uh, it's just so important to uh, keep that message alive. There's so many reasons 
that the death penalty is wrong, how in the world can anybody think it's right again? You're right. They ignore this stuff. They ignored it, Judge. You're absolutely right. They ignored everything you put into your report because I read it. And I bet you that none of them could understand it as well as I have because they didn't read it either. You're absolutely right. Stick with it. Questions? I'll take, uh, I don't know where John went. Oh, there it is. One more? Take one more question. Yes, sir. Did you experience any violence in prison? Yes, I did. I, uh, I got hit in the back of the head with a sock full of batteries. I got stabbed in the calf with a welding rod. I got hit in the chest with a master lock on a sheet rope. I seen my best friend, uh, I didn't see it, but I was at the aftermath. He took two pencils and shoved them right through his eyes. Prison's a bad, bad place. And, you know, I was accused of killing a child. You know, and the greatest thing that happened to me was, was that I had knowledge. Albert Einstein said the best way to knowledge is experience. I know what it's like in this place. If you want to talk about accountability for people, we all have to live with people who have done in this country. We have to live with the Michael Addisons to kill a police officer trying to do his job. But we can't execute that man. Let him live with what he's done in the rest of his life, just like we do, except he has to live in that hole. He has to live in that cell for the rest of his life and think about it. That's the best way to go. I want to thank you all very much. You've been great.